Welcome to the Answers for Elders radio show. Meet the trusted experts who will give you straight answers and will help guide you on the path of later life care. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dr. Sean Weiss, founder of Senior Health and Wellness Group, doctor, physical therapy, and health coach. And this is Vitality Revolution, and I am so honored to be a part of the Vitality Revolution through the Answers for Elders Network. I've been one of their experts for about 13 years, and this is such an important event. I believe this is our second annual um, event to have Vitality Revolution. And the purpose of Vitality Revolution really is uplifting seniors and helping them to uh, maximize their quality of life. Um, have joy in their life. And we do this by addressing the eight foundational principles of wellness. And today we are addressing one of the very important foundational principles of spirituality. And I am honored to have my new friend, John Wenderline. He's a chaplain. And more importantly, he's a hospice chaplain and an author. And today we're going to talk about love, which I think is really what it's all about. And I want to welcome you, John, to the Vitality Revolution. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor just to come together with people that you've only met over the phone till now, and you just have a common bond with or a common care or a common passion that seems sometimes to be overwhelming. But Ma, thank you for letting me come on and just have conversation. Well, I know our conversations thus far have been just, just wonderful, and it just warms my heart. And I'm so happy that you're going to be on here and this topic of, you know, really does, it doesn't matter how old you are, it comes down to to love. And I think it's such an uplifting message. And um, I would love for you to start with an introduction of yourself and the story of how you became a chaplain. And then we'll move on to some of these uh, wonderful things about how to live a glorious life and the message you've given me before, which I mean, I just, I just love and I can't wait for everybody to hear it. But let's hear about how you became a chaplain. Well, uh, finishing a degree in the late 90s, um, at the same time, one of our presidents had decided to put us in a war, and they were calling up some of the young men that were in my seminary classes. To, they were in the National Guard. And if you can remember that far back, I'm sure you're not that old, but I, if you can remember I that am. far back. <laughs> <laughs> I was they, in college. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> many weren't happy to go. And, you know, I read an article that said for every... 1,500 men who served in all the branches, there was one chaplain. Now, I was sitting in a class. Now, you got to understand, I've always been kind of bivocational as a pastor. I have had a very good, very successful job, and it just started to overwhelm me. I was in my early 40s. I was going to be 41, if I remember. And I remember coming home and telling my wife, uh, honey, I think I'm going to join the military. And she looked at me and smiled. She said, well, you better join the Navy because your father's a Navy guy. So I remember trying to join the Navy and they said, well, sir, God bless you, but you're a little too old. You know, so I left that and I tried the army. I tried all of them. Got a beautiful letter from the army saying, you know, if we need you, we'll call you and God bless you. But so I went home thinking, you know, what do I do? So I happened to be visiting a customer, dropping off a bill that they were supplying, I was supplying product to. And I left his office and I happened to look to the right and there was a door there and it said hospice on it. And I went, hospice. Oh, that's like, those are those companies that deal with dead people. You know, I'm, I have no clue. Back. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to go in there and say, hello. I'm going to hand them a business card. Maybe they need a volunteer. And from that conversation I had with a, with a lady who'd been with the company 20 years and she was the, she was the promoter of people who helped. She says, John, let me introduce you to the lady who's in charge of the branch. And I said, okay. So I thought, uh oh, I talked her ear off or did something. Something's going on. They got to run me off. And the <laughs> sweet lady, Amy, came in and says, John, you know, we're looking for someone who can just work part time. Would you do that? I said, of course, I want to volunteer. And from that, it went into working full time. She called me back into our office about six months later after I'd been working for him just part-time and said, John, you know, we really would like you to come and work full-time. So I jokingly tell people at that moment, I lost all kinds of income because I went to work in the hospice business. As you know, <laughs> yes, it's you totally know true. the medical industry 
has some false normers, you know. And but from that, I um, I've been doing it about nine, eight or nine years. And I wish I would have, you know, the Lord would have touched my heart in in, in when I was forty. But uh, I can't imagine doing anything else, you know. Today I work. I still work doing what I do. And you know, I was in a room today with with family members, and it was just nothing like it praying. But that's kind of how it got started. Me writing a couple books. If you would have known me my whole life, you'd have known pretty much everything I did was either with a football helmet on or I wrestled. So I had foot, I had wrestling coaches and football coaches that said, John, you'll pass that grade. So for me, <laughs> yeah, for me to undertake a couple books um, was just a great passion. I'm going to be working on my third book and, you know, only by the grace of God. That's what I tell people. Well, it's immediately evident that that you have a gift and you have a gift for putting people at ease and helping people. And, you know, as I look back on the 26 years that I have spent so far in, in taking care of older adults, um, you know, well older adults or people who have multiple um, chronic illnesses. And there's a lot of, of, um, of parallels in terms of no matter where you are, there's going to, there seems to be a struggle. And what I find as we uh, take care of older adults um, and that they get towards end of life stages, again, there's conflict, there's fear. Um, they need to come to peace with things. And I feel that um, and we see a lot of family strife in the industry that I'm in. And, but I always feel that we, you know, our duty is to advocate and our duty is to advocate for those clients and their families to promote um, wellness and that comes in many different forms and certainly from a mindset standpoint um, an emotional wellness standpoint um, it is so important that people um, ground their spirituality whatever that might be whatever that yeah. might look like and to be yeah. able to appreciate um, regardless of, of what that looks like for somebody else that maybe it's not what is the same for you or me but um, you know I've had the, the great honor of being with a few people who have passed while they passed and it's one of the greatest gifts honestly I look at that and something that you're doing is just it's just, it's just so special it takes special very special people to do what you're doing so um I wanted to talk about kind of um you know people you know feelings you know back up to over 50 years old right as we you know enter a different phase of our life and we approach retirement and gosh you know people think oh retirement's glorious right and all these things and so that's stressful. There are a lot of major life events that cause stress and retirement is one of them. Uh, chronic diseases, um, life-threatening illnesses, and people start to think, hey, am I living the life that I want to live, right? Am I going to go out and check out the way I want to check out, right? So Absolutely. I would love for you to talk to us a little bit about how you um, approach somebody and how you promote them to live a glorious life, to like make it as fulfilling and joyful as possible. Well, absolutely. Let me tell you, I can tell you a quick little story. You know, our nurses will go out and visit our patients. Um, and when they find that they're not able to give them anything but medical understandings of what's going on, they call the spiritual guy in. That's me. Now <laughs> you have to understand as maybe contrary to what some people believe, I don't walk into a room, a patient's room, uh, explaining to them the only way to live a life is to find Jesus Christ, and you know, which I understand that's all very important and essential in my life. I think it's key, and well, I know it's key, to, for them to understand that I'm there because I want to be there. I'm there because I, I, I love them, I care for them. And I had a patient that one of my nurses said, can you go see this gentleman? And I, I went and saw him yesterday, hard, rough around the edges, lived a tough life, dysfunctional family, estranged from his children. I can give you the list. You just fill in the blanks. And, you know, he, after a 10 or 15 minute conversation, he realized I wasn't there to have him learn the secret handshake or say those words. Say magic words. Magic words. Okay, you're good to go. You know, you're safe. You slid in the home base, that whole thing. He said, 
you know, he started to open up to me. He said, you know, I lost three of my siblings within nine months. Even my youngest sister died. He said, you know, they were all good people and I'm not a good person. I was never really a great person. Uh, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, let's just talk. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't quote a bunch of scripture. Now, I do use the principles within the scripture to speak about things. You know, uh, New Thetic Counseling, Christian Counseling is very key to me. And I use that just in the reference to say, there's a reason. I, I start with basically that uh, love is an action verb. It requires action. It doesn't, you know, Gus, let's face it. When you were younger and you were dating that first gentleman, and, I, you know, I might have been guilty of it myself when I was younger. That I love you business seems to spew out of our mouths. But, you know, I'll give you the classic example. I had was called, we, we are on call as, as hospice chaplains at the hospital. And sometimes with hospice, which means we would go into a person's home if they're, you know, not doing well or maybe if they've passed. And I remember four or five years ago walking into, being a call at two o'clock in the morning, driving to a house in a better part of town and walking into the house and the house was full of people. There must have been 20 people in this house. And they escorted me back to this room. And in this room was a sweet little lady propped up on a pillow, on pillows. And she was having, she was struggling. And around her were all these people who adored her. She had great, great grandchildren. And I walked over and I grabbed a chair and I sat next to her and I put my, I reached out and grabbed her hand, which was much smaller than mine. And I said, sweet lady, you're not doing well. And she says, well, no, I'm not, but I'll be okay. And, you know, at that moment, I looked up and I, it reminded me of a, of a Norman Rockwell painting. You remember Norman Rockwell? He had, the ability, yeah, he had the ability to catch life, catch it on a canvas. And I looked around that room and I said, let's pray. And, you know, 25 people in this house, Christian or not, bowed their head in respect to this sweet lady. And while I was sitting there, she went, she passed away. And it was just, so, you know, how do I explain that that was such a wonderful, glorious time, that that was such evidence of love that we'll, we'll never be able to duplicate. So for right. me, for me, Jesus, you can take everything that the Lord said the two or three years that he wandered this earth and boil it down to one simple fact. If you don't have love in your heart, you don't have me. That's what he always used to say. So mm -hmm. I'm not a prosthesizer. I don't, uh, I don't thump people with the Bible, but, uh, and some will go and some will not go. And I have no idea of whatever condition they're in. But I know at the moment that I visit them, at the moment I come into their life, they know that I care for them. That's all that matters. So that's, and they that's feel me. that in their heart. And that's, that's so, so important. So to be important. Yes, to be real, you have to, you don't have to, you just uh, make it evident. You, you, with your body language, you know, it's all about body language anyway. Um, and I adore, I can't wait to get to the next patient. I know that sounds crazy. I tell people I'm a chaplain, they go, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, it's such a wonderful job. When I tell them I'm a hospice chaplain, they go, oh, how do you do that? Oh, I couldn't do that. I said, I can't imagine him not doing that. So, so rewarding. You know, and you it's know. Just, and, and you know that ahead. you're you're providing that love into somebody's heart. And you're just, regardless of not knowing their situation, you don't need to know their situation necessarily, oh. right? But you know That's where right. they are in their life. And you know that by providing them a kind ear and a loving heart, that that's your role, right? That's that's what you were there for. And, um, and it, it is very fulfilling. I've, I've had the honor of, of being with my grandmother and my husband's father when they passed. And um, I'm a firm believer. And I, I just, I feel I, I have, you know, I'm intuitive with that. And that might be my medical background of just kind of knowing these things. Right. That's but, right. Um, you know, my grandmother, um, it was not fearful at all. Um, we didn't know she was going to pass the day that she passed, but I know that she knew um, she passed on the day that her oldest son passed. And um, we were all in the room and his children were there. 
And we had just looked at the calendar and realized what day it was. Right. It was, you know, and I was sitting on one side of her and my cousin, who was his youngest daughter, had, you know, he had passed about four years prior and um, we were sitting there talking and I think, I think I was painting her nails, you know, and, you know, she's, she's, you know, about to pass and um, I go, oh my goodness, Katie, it's October the 30th and we were just, you know, we were all so taken and like not paying attention and we're like, wow. Like, wow, that was the day her dad had passed. And, um, you know, she got up and we said goodbyes and she left. And within probably five minutes, um, I noticed. And um, then we all came around and I'm thinking she knew. She knew she was ready. Absolutely. And she's a very faithful lady, Southern. Um, I don't know if you know any primitive First Baptist down in the (laughs) hollers of Virginia. (laughs) They yeah. are, they are hard yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we you, would go down there as children when <laughs> somebody died. That was when we went, right? And uh, I remember our, my, me and my cousins, I was the oldest, and we were all stair-stepped, you know, as, as children. You know, and we sat in the pew, like, <laughs> you know. Oh, that, yeah. oh, wow, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They, yeah, they, are, of, yeah. they are very, very reserved in their, in their faith. Uh, oh, yes. But, very, you know, <laughs> very reserved. They're and reserved. With, within all things they did they were very reserved but uh, yeah I, I've known a few I'm a I'm a Southern Baptist minister by ordination so I know okay. that, uh, I know that uh, uh, those primitive Baptists are hey, we can learn from all we can learn from every all. I agree I totally yeah. agree with that um, um, you know John I feel like too you know it, and like I said I'm, I'm learning so much from you even the more I talk to you but um, I come across patients and like I said, you know, the important thing is like, yeah, well, those with medical backgrounds, you know, we just, you can't look at everybody through that lens. Right. But when I see people who are just um, fearful and angry and you just are trying so hard to just maximize their quality of life and just have them get joy and fulfillment, how do you address those who you can sense immediately are just fearful of what is to come and they don't have a piece about it. Well, I have to tell you, for me, it's tragic. It doesn't happen very often. You know, I would say this, and I say this with all sincere heart, the, the scripture tells us, and I use that as my base, that there are no atheists, that within all of us, we have a, some sort of some sort of understanding. And I tell you, being with hundreds of people who have passed, spending sometimes up to a year or so with them, visiting them on a regular basis. I have yet to find somebody who didn't have either a great fear of the unknown or even a a fear of the fact of what's to come, even though their faith was strong. I remember I had a sweet lady, um, God bless her. She was tough, tough, you know, that 97 year old, northern new york democratic kind of <laughs> athlete kind of you know just just i'm not a stereotypical she was stereotypical that person and i remember her saying chaplain you're not afraid to die and i said how do you know that well you're a chaplain you're like a priest and i said do not be fooled sweet lady my glorious day will be that i go out of this world in glory but i may go out screaming but either way god loves <laughs> And, you know, we had the best relationship. Her, <laughs> her son was a professional and worked for a large bottling company in Europe. And I remember when she got sick, it was just at the begin, just before the COVID hit. And he called me on the phone. She said, you know, mama's sick. Can you come to the hospital? I had to drive about an hour, which was close to where your, your daughter lives. And um, there she was with her family who'd flown from all over the world to be with her. And he looked, her son looked at me and said, mama has done nothing but talk about you. I said, uh-oh. Is it good or bad? Yeah, that's the way they do it. There's no middle ground. So um, the point I was making is, he looked at me when it was done, and she passed while I was there. And I remember him saying, "You know, Mom sure did love you for just having that short time that she was. She was only with me six or seven months." I said, "You know, his name is Charlie." I said, "Well, Charlie, that's because I loved her." I said, "I know you don't know me." You've flown in, you've got jet lag from flying in from Europe. I said, but 
your mother was a wonder. But you know what we forget is my patients are, are as much a blessing to me, to me, than I, than I can ever be to them. Because, you know, we get the opportunity to walk into their life, as you know, because you deal with this, at the end of their life. So all the dynamics, all the family mm, mess, the swampy things are there. And you get the opportunity to spend those last last times with them and just let them know it's it's going to be okay, which is tough, but it's going to be okay. And that is tough. And, you know, as, as I, you know, deal with primarily taking care of those over 65, you know, one of the important things we do is, you know, we are in constant communication with the families, right? The children and uh, who are, you know, my age, 50 and over, and I know that there are so many people on this platform that um, are struggling and dealing with changes of, you know, with their parents and grandparents who maybe have chronic illnesses or cancer or something where they are maybe not feeling that they're in a good place with their relationships. And we see that on a daily basis, right? You know, we will encounter people who maybe are not on hospice or not at end right. of life, but, you know, they might be 85 and they live in an assisted living and they're by themselves and you just know when you know somebody doesn't have visitors or you know when somebody does have visitors and you can just sense um the some of the issues there and we are always trying to uh, when we communicate with family members uh, of advocating for you know a sense of, of love and um like i said having to not be involved and not know the situations of why they might be estranged or what the story is but I always felt that we've had a unique ability to to bring people together, which, you know, because we see and from our eyes, something totally different. Right. right um, we're not the children. And we, you know, we might we might see the good. We might see the progress they're making. We might see the hope that they have. And we want to make sure that we are spreading that love um, with the family members who who we are communicating with about their conditions. So. Um, I do feel that, you know, there's probably people listening today who are wondering how to, you know, go about um, speaking with a father or a mother or a grandparent who they just feel they have some unfinished business with. Do you ever come across that where you find yourself also chaplaining to family members? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I say it a thousand times. I've said it a thousand times. There's no, there's no class on being a caregiver. There's no training. There's basic principles. There's basic things that you have to do, but every situation is different. So the toughest, the toughest thing is uh, for some to say goodbye in the process of saying goodbye. And there are on, on always something unsaid or something undone. I always make an attempt to try to bring families together. So it's, sometimes it's not successful. You'd be surprised. Sometimes the the hurt is so bad, or the viciousness or meanness is so so. There's just no love that you can rekindle. That you that many of my patients will die alone, having three or four fa three or four children, and they'll die alone. I can tell some tragic stories right. um, across. Yeah. I have to be a little immune to all that, but, you know, I have to, I think to be honest with you, if you, if you, if you present yourself in a caring, loving way, it rubs off. It, it fills the room. It fills people's lives. It fills situations with a starting point, a change. Right. Cause you know, when you're sincere, when you sincerely care, it's hard for someone to, to sincerely hate. To sincerely, I, I hate. agree with that, and I feel Absolutely. that everybody deep down, yes, you know, uh, understands that. And I feel like even though we might not know the situations, and it's none of our business with the situations, and you're not right. going to mend every situation. But no. I always look at it as, um, you know, we might tell my kids, even if I'm 54, and and I certainly now look back and reflect on things as I'm oh. getting older and my kids are gone out of the house. And you're just thinking, you know, life is short and you don't want regrets. And I kind of always 
you know, phrase it that way. It's like, if there's something you want to say, regardless of the situation, regardless if you're not going to mend everything, don't have regrets of, I wish I would have, or I wish I would have said this, or I wish I would have had this conversation just to have peace, right? I, I am absolutely in full agreement with you. We have a like minds. I, I, I usually will tell people when I meet them, I don't want to hear what it could have should have out of your mouth. I don't want to hear it because I hear it. You know, Bill and I was going to go traveling. We were going to buy an RV. We were going to, we were going to, we were going to. We were going to, yep. I should have. You know, what I want to hear from them is it's okay. And, you know, reflection, unless you're talking about it in your age, comes to us all. You know, it's funny. There's an old song from the 60s. Uh, there's a time to live and a time to die. It's out of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, I think the third chapter. But it says, you know, there's a, I think it's by the birds or somebody like that. But it yeah. says, you should read those eight verses because in that, it reflects the positive and the negative things that happen in our lives. There's a lot of time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. And, you know, at the end of somebody's life, there's a time for, if possible, reconciliation. But, I never as much concerned myself with the family members and trying to resolve this craziness as I do okay. the patient. Because for me, he or she is my number one concern. And, you know, I'm a harbor of probably, I would say probably a half a dozen or so, and I haven't really counted, people in my career have gone to their grave screaming, gone to their grave not being able to be medicated. And you know what it's like in the medical field, not to be able to give enough morphine to do the job mm -hmm. or add a van, settle them down. Um, I can tell you just, and, they, and you know, those people have stuck in my heart and stuck in my spirit in that mm -hmm. they were just to stay, saw no hope. I can't let, I can't let family dynamics control the moment. Because sometimes I have, sometimes I have minutes, sometimes I have days, sometimes I have weeks and months and years. You don't know the progression of death. It's funny you said earlier that you have a sixth sense about when you you see people passing. Well, I have to say I'm no medical doctor or I'm no nurse, and I rely exclusively on my nurses to tell me they're close, John. Can you go see them? I have been going one way to see a patient and have a nurse call me and turn around to find myself in a room with a patient that I really never visited with uh, while, while she drew her last breath um, and holding her hand and tears in the room. So we don't know. But I think as long as we have proper intent, you know, we will do our job for our patients, because they are really, you are my biggest concern, I know, mm -hmm. so. And it's it's never too late to start looking at your life and realizing that, you know, there's one situation of being on hospice and kind of having some preparation for what's to come, but there's something to be said about advocating for just living the fullest life that you can, because you don't know what is going to happen right and you don't know that there'll be a tomorrow or you don't know you can't control all the circumstances of life and so i feel as we get older it's 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 critical to start understanding that and and really prioritize what is most important and like you said it, it all comes down to to love Absolutely. right and you making know, I... sure that you won't have any regrets if something were to happen to you tomorrow did you tell the people you love them? Did you Absolutely. say what you needed to say and not and not have those regrets, right? That's absolutely true. You know, I, I it's funny. Have you have you seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? You remember that movie? Uh, more than once. Yes. Okay. So you know there's a scene in that movie where he finally finds his lieutenant's grave. And the camera, God bless, I guess, uh, whoever the producer was, Steven Sp was that Spielberg. Spielberg. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a picture of him looking at the, the man in the picture, looking at the, the grave of his lieutenant and his wife standing there. And then in the background 
our three children, and they look to be maybe in their late teens. And he looks at his wife and he says, was I a good man? Was I a good man? Was I a good person? And his wife looks at him with somewhat of astonishment and says, you were a wonderful man. You were a wonderful husband, wonderful father. So for me, because I have a child and I have grandbabies, mm -hmm. if I was to go, if I was to leave this earth today, they would know, even though I'm gone, that Papa loved them. Yeah. And that's a reflection. I'm telling you, yep. we start to reflect as we get older. I have never had, I have never had a 95 year old woman tell me, or a 95 year old man tell me, you know, Chaplain, life has been so slow. I just can't. It's just so slow. Is it ever going to come to an end? <laughs> this you know, is so true. Life is so by a thousand miles an hour, a thousand miles an hour. And we, mm -hmm. you know, to live a life our, our fullest, you know, again, I, I don't want to be, I want to tell you that uh, Christ told the disciples who kept aggravating them all the time about asking questions. He said, it's not for you to know. He said, but I tell you, just live a full life. Live a full, happy life. And when it's time, I'll, I'll come. I'm, be, I'm paraphrasing. But he said, I'll come get you. You'll not know the time or place. So I will walk into a room when I first meet a patient, and I'll see maybe a wheelchair beside their bed. I said, oh, do you get up? First of all, I ask them if they're not, if how they're feeling. Because if they're sick or not feeling good, I call our nurse right away. Because that's what palliative care is all about. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be my patients in pain. Mm -hmm. And when I see a wheelchair or a walker, I'll say, oh, do you get up and get out? And they don't come up with some kind of excuse why they're not. Because they've been getting some bad news. You know, within five days of people coming on hospice, I I have to see them by law, by, you know, the government. And, you know, they're just now processing this thing that says you're going to come to an end. And um, I always advocate for them to get up, get out, get some sun, whatever. Get moving, get living. Get yep. Moving. And, I, and they'll often ask me, Chaplain, I don't know why I'm still here. I've buried my children. I've buried my husband, all my siblings. I said, sweet lady or sweet man, you're here for me and for all the CNAs and all those people to come visit you because you still have something worth listening to. So, you know, I become, I don't know what the word is. I become, my wife says I've become their best friend. <laughs> so I have a lot of friends. <laughs> well, and I think that that is, it's, it's just wonderful and it's just so heartwarming and I've really appreciated our conversation. And like I said, just, just knowing to, to promote, just getting out there and living life to its fullest and finding love and in all situations is, is really the key um, as we, as we age and, and get older, regardless of the circumstances. So it has been wonderful talking to you. And I so appreciate you coming on Vitality Revolution to share your knowledge and your stories and the love that you have in your heart. And um, thank you so, so much for joining us. I'm glad. Um, if they want to read, read my books, you can go to rememberme.jw.com or you can go to Amazon and type my name in. Uh, it's not a book. It's not, they're not medical books. They're just, they're just books filled with a lot of sweet stories. And we're going to um, put those links for your books, Chaplain, and that's um, on the site so that people feel you know drawn to to go get those they'll have an easy way to go search those out and i appreciate you sending me those books as well oh good thank you well it was a blessing to be on your show and again call on me anytime i appreciate it thank you chaplain answers for elders thanks you for watching the vitality revolution discover a blueprint to find a whole new gear in life new awareness and greater potential Subscribe and be a part of our community. Answers for Elders is the North Star of Navigating Senior Care, featuring content to help later life go a lot easier.